My being here is the return of the native. You are obviously, as a judge, have the title of honorable. It's not what you decided in the court. It's the way you lived your life that you are the title of honorable. When I was a kid, Judge Layton was looked upon as being the model that you followed. So here was an example of a man who overcame uh, adversity to become a very eminent federal judge and uh, remained at the same time a wonderful human being. He was on the short list to be appointed to the Supreme Court at the same time that Thurgood Marshall was appointed, that, that Judge Layton was on the short list of less than a dozen people of possible candidates for the Supreme Court. I was born in the early morning hours of Tuesday October 22, 1912, in a three-story wooden frame building that used to be at 9 Howland Street in New Bedford, Massachusetts. My mother and father were immigrants from Brava, Portuguese Cape Verde Island. They never spoke any English or any American English. We never spoke English at home. We spoke Criollo. I still speak Criollo. Not fluently, but if I get among Creole people in a, in a half hour, I'd be easily talking the, the dialect. I have said facetiously that we did not live in New Bedford. And I have always been tempted to add that those of us who think we know the English language know the difference between living and hibernating. We hibernated in New Bedford. New Bedford, Massachusetts was the only place that my mother and father knew of where in late December each year they could rent an unheated flat and put us there to protect us from the harsh winters that New Bedford had. Like other Cape Verdean families at the time, the Leyton family tried many ways to support themselves. My father first was a grocery store owner, but he failed. And slowly, because of the shifting economy of New Bedford, you know, it was once whaling, then it became um, manufacturing, my father tried all of it. My mother did. I remember her taking me to the factories and trying to get me to use one of the machines. But they finally got to be agricultural workers for Mr. Russell LeBaron Baca of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Now, it was my mother and father, not Mr. Baca, who made me a child laborer on the bogs, picking cranberries, weeding. The only time I went to public school is when they brought us to New Bedford in late December. And we went to public school the rest of December, January, February. Then the first week in March, they put us in a, pa a paddy truck to wear them. Early in his education, his name was changed to Layton. Just north of South Street, on a cushioned avenue. There used to be a school called the Acushnet Avenue Elementary School. It was in that block. One day when I was around four years old and I was attending that school in the wintertime, my regular teacher or our regular teacher could not teach us that afternoon and a substitute teacher was sent in. Her name, as I remember it, was Mary Fitzgerald. At a certain point in the afternoon, Mary Fitzgerald went from desk to desk asking each pupil, what is your name? 
When she came to me, I looked up at her. She was a tall, lanky woman with long fingers. I looked up to her and said, Yanome e George Neves Leitão. Now, those people who know the Portuguese language know that the Portuguese language has a habit of using a diuresis over AO, the diphthong, and that AO is pronounced ang, leitang. And my family name was at that point George N. Leitang. Well, Mary Fitzgerald could neither say, pronounce, or spell Leitang. And without anything else, she said to me sternly, as if I had committed a crime, she said, your name is George, ne George N. Leighton. And then she spelled it, L-E-I-G-H-T-O-N, and blessed me as if she was the Pope. <laughs> well, I, I, I took the name. Uh, adopted it and um, said nothing to anybody. I went home, told my mother about it. She paid no attention. My father didn't say anything. And I began using it in school. And after that, at every turn, I used the name George N. Layton. It has helped me because it makes it easy for me to become amalgamated into American society. Judge Layton completed the sixth grade at Roosevelt Junior High School. An event at the beginning of the seventh grade would change his life forever. It all began, ladies and gentlemen, one afternoon in December 1929. When my mother called the principal of the Roosevelt Junior High School and told him to send me home because she had a job for me on an oil tanker that was going to leave Fall River, Massachusetts for Aruba, Dutch West Indies. My brother-in-law, the husband of my oldest sister, Candida, was the steward on that oil tanker. And the next day, he took me to Fall River. And that was the last time I had set foot in a public school. The time he was going, attending Roosevelt School, his family was facing many hardships like other Cape Verdean families, you know, lack of employment, lack of income, and things like that. So parents at that time, were taking their children, once they became of age to leave school, they would take them out and try to find employment for him. In his case, his mother was uh, fortunate to know someone in the, sh in the maritime service that could help the judge, and so they, they did find him a job on a ship. But once he embarked on a ship, he found that this wasn't, wasn't, wasn't what he wanted to do. He wanted to do uh, you know, other things. He wanted to advance beyond that. I went to the ocean, but I came back to New Bedford. Even though I was taken out of school in this way, I never lost my determination to become educated. Well, he talked about how um, he loved going to the New Bedford Public Library. And um, he talked about certain books that he liked. There was one about forensics. and how the shape of a man's skull could um, determine whether or not he have a criminal future. And so he loves to talk about that one. I took that book with me on this trip to Aruba. I read it from cover to cover. It was a legal tome. Every criminologist that has lived since Lombroso has repudiated the theory that you can tell a criminal by his cranium. But the reading of that book led me to read other books. I never lost sight of it. I went to WPA classes when I came back to New Bedford. I even took correspondence courses in mathematics, in history, in English grammar. 
I wanted to be a college graduate. Once he left uh, Roosevelt as a very young man to go to sea and found that wasn't to his liking, it didn't stop him from seeking education because he strongly felt that in order to get ahead, he was going to have to persevere and get himself a good education, which he did. You know, it's wonderful. By 1936, I had done a lot of reading by myself, books I borrowed, I borrowed from the New Bedford Public Library. I learned a lot about American universities and colleges, who founded them, uh, what was their goal and purpose. I learned about Howard University in Washington, D.C., that it was a black college and that it was put up there to aid African slaves, American African slaves, after they were emancipated, become integrated into American society. This was the goal of Howard University. General O. O. Howard was the founder. For some way of reasoning, I decided that that was the school for me. Now, why would it be? I don't know. In 1934, many of you know, the SS Olympic ran into a Coast Guard ship off the coast of Nantucket, and four Cape Verdean Americans were killed in that disaster. A lawyer whose name was Alfred J. Gomes thought of the idea of collecting money from among Cape Verdean people and other people as well, and form a scholarship essay contest in memory of those Cape Verdean seamen. Even though I hadn't gone to a high school and everyone doubted I knew how to read and write, I entered the essay contest. I and Henry Peters were the two winners. Mr. Gomes invited me to come to New Bedford and receive my prize. Well, I was elated. Here I had $200. And in 1936, $200 for someone as broke as I was, was a lot of money. My sister Virginia, who's here, and I went to Montepio Hall in New Bedford. It was a gala affair. We sat in the platform all evening Everybody was making speeches about Henry Peters. What a great scholar he was. What a great athlete. What a great football player, baseball player. Finally, they began leaving. They gave him his check for $200. I went to Mr. Gomes. I said, Mr. Gomes, uh, you wrote to me and told me to come here. I thought... I would get my $200. He told me when they wouldn't give me the $200 that they just didn't believe I was going to get into Howard University. But they modified it. And I have said, and I said on that occasion when I spoke, if I were in Mr. Gomes's position, I had gone around New Bedford and Wareham and Onset and uh, Hyannis and uh, Yarmouth and Carver and got money from Cape Verdean laborers to put together two $200 prizes. And then a guy like me comes along and by some quirk of the rules, I win one of the $200. I wouldn't have given, them the, given him the $200 either. I would have done something like what they did. Here's what they did. When Mr. Gorham finished with me that evening at Montebello Hall, and he said, George, they told me to write to you, and I forgot. I believed him. He said, I, I tell you what, what we decided to do. We're going to send $100 of your money to the treasurer of Howard University, telling the treasurer that when you arrive there, if you do, he says, because, you know, the distance between New Bedford and Howard University, I think about 800 miles, I think it was. He said, if you do get to Howard University, 
uh, and you show them your credential, the Joe George and Layton, they have to give you $25 of the, of the $100. And if you make it through the first semester, we'll send them the other 100 Now, I can't think of anything more fair. Can you? <laughs> you know, it's what honest, it's what an honest man, you know, Here's this jerk <laughs> come from nowhere. <laughs> he gets into Howard University. And so uh, I, I, there was no guarantee that I was going to finish. I was surprised the first time I found out that he did not graduate from high school. That was amazing to me. But he took it upon himself and fearlessly he went off to Howard University. And, and that's when he, uh, like I said, embarked on a career that he retired from. It was hard enough going, out, going from college to high school. I can't imagine going to college and not having gone to high school. And then going to Howard, that's pretty amazing for a Cape Verdean, uh, a Cape Verdean to go to Howard back in, uh, back in those days because, um, well, for a lot of reasons. It's a black university at, at a time when Cape Verdeans were not going to black universities. It was also, it was not New Bedford. It was not Massachusetts. The fact that this young man had the initiative to get on a, to get, somehow, get down to Washington, D.C. to go to a university. How did he ever hear about Howard University? I could have easily had said, oh, go to Washington, D.C.? You've never been there? You don't know anybody in Washington? You don't have a job in Washington? You don't have any money? Go back to the Cranberry Bar. I could easily have done that. But no, I didn't. I took to the roads, hitchhiked part of the way to Providence, got a truck, went further to Connecticut, then on to New York. Then I took a, someone told me I could take a train in New York to Union Station, Washington, D.C. And I landed there. I went there to talk with the admission officers at Howard to admit me as any way they wanted to, and they did. They made me an unclassified student because I wasn't qualified to receive a degree. Well, I entered like that. Judge Layton was informed by then registrar, Mr. F. D. Wilkinson, if he proved he could do college work, Howard University would make him a candidate for a degree. I had no tutor. I don't know who showed me the way to the library. I found it though. I made friends. I was active in student affairs. I wrote essays. People noticed me. And in my examinations, I got A's. B plus, A plus, A minus. And then in March of 1940, I received a letter from the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. I didn't solicit the letter. I didn't go ask him. He wrote to me and told me that on June 7, 1940, Howard University was going to graduate me from the College of Liberal Arts magna cum laude. That in Latin means with great praise. He persevered, he studied, he read, he put himself through college at a time when he had no money, he was living in a city where he didn't know anybody, um, and he, he thrived. When I got this letter unsolicited telling me that I'm going to graduate, magna cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa. I decided that, that I could enter any law school in America. But well, he talked his way into Harvard Law School. I mean, the rest of us, you know, took the tests and applied. And Judge Layton basically talked his way into Harvard Law School at a time where there were maybe six people of color in each Harvard class. I found Howard University very easy to be in and get A's and B's and get to be magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa and so on. I found it very easy. 
No one told me, no one explained to me that there is a difference between studying law and studying literature. There's a difference. Law requires imagination to think through the legal problem and see the solution that's going to solve the problem of the client. See, no one told me that. So my first year, I had trouble at Harvard Law School. I didn't tell anybody about it, but I realized there was the trouble of the fact that I had never gone to a high school. Never had any teamwork, never had any analysis, uh, nothing like that. Um, but I, I hung on. I hung on. World War II broke out while Judge Layton was in his second year of law school. Once again, he left school, this time to fight for his country. I was washing dishes in the home of the secretary of David Walsh, senior United States senator from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on December 7, 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. That's what I was doing. Took four years of my life away from me. I had to go to the Pacific Theater. But I did well. I did well. I rose to the rank of captain, infantry. And one of my precious possessions is the letter of commendation that I have, written by General Devers, who was then in 1945, I think 45. He was then commander of United States ground troops, commending me for what I had done as an officer in four years uh, in the Pacific Theater. At the conclusion of World War II, Judge Layton returned to Harvard Law School. And went right in, into an accelerated program I did two years of law school in one year and also passed the bar at the same time. In 1946, Judge Layton wrote a letter to Walter White, president of the NAACP, to ask how one becomes a volunteer lawyer for the NAACP. October 4, 1946, Judge Layton met Walter White in New York. He also met Thurgood Marshall who would become his lifelong friend and the first African-American to serve on the Supreme Court. Thurgood Marshall believed that civil rights was a sacred field of law practice, that the lawyer who worked in that field should not expect a fee. I didn't agree with Walter, with uh, Thurgood, <laughs> and I did get paid in some cases, but that was his belief, and that's how he supported me in cases I took to the Supreme Court. Despite his excellent academic background and experience as a lawyer with the NAACP, Judge Layton had difficulty getting a job in his home state of Massachusetts. Every law school graduate faces this problem. Where was I to go to practice law? Where was I to go to use this knowledge and ability that I had acquired over 10 years of struggle including a world war. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, and I don't say this by way of criticism, but in October 1946, when I was struggling with this problem, where to go, I didn't receive any suggestion, word, or invitation from anybody in Massachusetts giving me an opportunity to practice law. No one from New Bedford offered me no one in Boston, no one. When he went to Harvard Law School, there was no, no prospect of a job coming out of law school. It's no, uh, when I was in law school, everybody was competing to see uh, if they can get into the best law firms. You know, and it was, a, it was a real uh, tragedy if you didn't get into one of the top Wall Street law firms. But the idea that you can go to Harvard Law School and not get a job, that's a different universe. One of the, sad, one of the saddest part of his journey was here in New Bedford, the fact that the people here that were empowered to do something that could have helped the judge get a job, 
as an attorney, and they failed him. So I was confronted with a simple question. Where would I go to use this knowledge that I had acquired? I decided on Chicago, Illinois, for a very simple reason. I found out that Chicago, Illinois, had the second largest African-American population in the United States. And also, I found out that Chicago, Illinois, was the only place in America in 1946 that had a black person in Congress. His name was Otto Oscar de Priest, who was succeeded by Arthur Mitchell, who in turn was succeeded by William L. Dawson. In my simple way of reasoning, I came to the conclusion that a community that could send, the only community like it in America, that could send one of its own to Congress was the place I wanted to be. So I went to Chicago. At the end of law school, he went to Chicago. He was looking for a place to practice, and he's from Massachusetts. He's already been to Washington, but he just got up and went to Chicago, not knowing anybody, and he decided that this is a place where he could build a legal career, and that's absolutely amazing. See, Washington, D.C. and Chicago were the same. I didn't know anybody in Chicago when I went there in uh, October 14, 1946. I didn't know anybody in Chicago. The one thing I had was a letter from Sadie Alexander, who was the secretary of the National Bar Association. That was the African-American Bar Association because in 1946, I, because of my color, I couldn't join the American Bar Association. Uh, African-American lawyers in, throughout the United States got together around 1940 or so and formed the uh, uh, National Bar Association. I learned that Sadie Alexander was the secretary. And I learned that she was a friend of Earl B. Dickerson, who was an alderman in Chicago and was a lawyer and was a civil rights attorney. I asked Sadie Alexander, give me a letter of introduction to uh, Earl B. Dixon, and she did. That was the only thing I had to show anybody that I was George N. Layton, that I was a graduate of Howard University, magna cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, and that I was a second lieutenant in the reserve infantry, and that I finished my studies at Harvard Law School around October 14, 1946. His first job in Chicago was with Christopher C. Winbush. I walked all over the city of Chicago looking for some place and so on. Couldn't find one. I met a man who told me he was a graduate of Harvard Law School. He was colored. And I told him, I'm going to give up. I'm going back to Washington, get my wife and my daughter, and I'm going back to New Bedford. And I'm going to start there. This is what I told him. He said, wait a minute. He said, wait. He said, I know a firm near the White Sox Park, 35th and State Street. It's called Temple and Wimbish. Uh, uh, Wimbish is the um, rainmaker. He, made the, he gets the, the client. He's ward committeeman. He's a state senator. But he doesn't go to court. He had a man in his office who went to court for him. He would get the client. The man then would go to the law, uh, court for, for, for the client. Today, that man has disappeared. Nobody knows what's become of him. I saw C.C. Wimbish this morning. He says he's out of his mind what to do. Why don't you go talk to him? I'll call him and I'll make the appointment. He did. That afternoon, I was seated in the office of Christopher C. Wimbish, ward committeeman of the Third Ward, 
and uh, Illinois State Senator, a colleague of Richard J. Daly, that was the old, the first Daly, and a colleague and associate of William L. Dawson, who's, who is in Congress. I found out that Chicago was the only place in America at that time that had a person of color in Congress. And it was, it was William L. Dawson. That's what made me go to Chicago to begin with. So here I was sitting down in C.C. Wimbish's office and telling him my troubles. Finally, he said to me, all right. He said, okay, all right. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let you come to my office. He said, but I want to explain to you, we don't pay any salary. He said, because um, every morning, weekdays, this corridor over here is filled with people looking for me to go to court with them. Some son has shot somebody or raped somebody or robbed somebody or burglarized somebody. He said, um, uh, I, I'll get the case, then I give it to you. I said, all right, will you take it? I said, I will. Now, the second thing I want to tell you is that we don't have a desk for you to, <laughs> for you to, for you to sit on. I said, well, all right. He said, but you see that pile of trash over there? I said, yeah. He said, underneath that trash is a desk. That's all covered with dust and stuff. If you wish, get to the bottom of that, take that desk, clean it, polish it, you can use it. This client that you get by waiting here in the morning is not your client. I said, all right. He said, he's my client. I will interview him, I will talk with him, I will decide on the fee, then he'll tell me what you do in court, and if he tells me you've done a good job, I will decide what portion of the fee you will get. <laughs> well, this was uh, November 1946, you understand? Mm -hmm. No pay. No desk, no client, but you know, between then and the following June, following June 47, I made enough money that I bought a two-story house in the west side of Chicago, and I was able to bring my wife and two daughters to Chicago, which is why I went there. Through his involvement with the NAACP, Judge Layton worked alongside many of the leaders of the Civil Rights Movement, including Thurgood Marshall, Constance Baker Motley, Roy Wilkins, and Robert Carter. I know the history of the NAACP. I knew that the work they were doing at that time, they were the only organization in America that was devoting time to this terrible, terrible situation that exists in this country of slavery, then Jim Crowism, all that. I know from personal experience. I was indicted in Chicago because I advised a black man that he had a right to move into an apartment that he had paid a rent for. And they, a race riot ensued. Uh, when he tried to move in, in Cicero. A grand jury was assembled, and when the grand jury returned the indictment, I was number one. <laughs> they, they charged me with uh, inciting a race riot, and so forth and so on. Well, all that did, it made me well known. Because... Um, the foreman of the grand jury asked me, after they subpoenaed me, why would you tell a black man, that's Harvey Clark, that he had a constitutional right to move into an apartment in Cicero? I said, well, because the Constitution of the United States that we live by says so. 
He said, what? I said, yes, sir. Uh, that constitution says that life, liberty, and property shall not be taken except by due process of law. I said, there's no taking more lacking in due process, more unfair than to tell a man he can't move into his apartment because he's black. Huh. So when the knife came down, I, I was number one. <laughs> and the, my partner told me the grand jury decided to make me a, an example, you know. His commitment to justice and the rights of individuals would be a driving force in his life's work. Several of his cases generated widespread media attention. See, if when you get to be respected as a lawyer, everybody respects you. Judges, newspaper people, they all do. Uh, you, 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 you formulate a reputation. You formulate a reputation. You don't monkey with anybody. You apply the law. Oh, they. Oh, I had a lot of cases that they attacked me in the newspapers. Uh, one case that I still remember, I uh, found a young, two young fellows. Uh, uh, they were Mexican Americans. Uh, they came to Chicago after the growing season in in uh, Dallas, Texas, and they were arrested, uh, charged with assaulting a police officer. What happened was the, one of the young fellows was walking down the street and he had a broken beer bottle in his hand. And the police saw him with a broken beer bottle in his hand and he testified before me, the police officer, that he could tell that this young fellow couldn't speak English. I said to myself, how can you look at somebody four o'clock in the morning just because he has a broken beer bottle in his hand, you can tell he can't speak English. <laughs> I didn't believe a word he said. And I acquitted. All the newspapers hung me. They demanded that I be impeached and that I be removed from the bench and so forth. It didn't happen. The closest thing to a wealthy client that I had was Sam Momo Giancana. He was reputed to be the chief of the mob in Chicago. But I never had a client that was so mild-mannered and respectful. Uh, I established uh, three conditions uh, that would have to be for me to represent him. One was that he would never go to court with me with his hat in front of his face. He had a habit of taking his hat and put it in front of his face. The second was that I needed funds to investigate everything which I did. He assured me of that. Third, I told him, if the time came and I need your testimony on anything about your case, you will testify. And he said, will you be there? I said, yes, I will. All right, I will. And he took the stand. I called him as a witness. One of the better stories I heard about him was his representation of uh, Sam Giancana, the reputed mafioso in Chicago, and how that um, it was a civil rights case that he represented this, this, this mafioso, reputed mafioso. And um, Giancana was being um, followed by the, um, the Justice Department, by Robert Kennedy and the Justice Department. And he came to Judge Layton because Judge Layton was a civil rights lawyer. And Judge Layton at first didn't see why this is a civil rights issue. And his friends would tell him, do you really, you know, why would you represent this man? And he listened to the story and he said, this is a man who was getting prosecuted and problems were persecuted by the Justice Department. Uh, and that they were following the church, following when he bought groceries. And he said, these are violations of his civil rights. And he could see past the man and past the man's reputation and see that everybody, even a reputed mafioso, has civil rights. He came to me because uh, I had represented another man. This one was black. Uh, who was oppressed by the government. 
I had done it successfully and this judge remembered and recommended to the Giancana family that I rep represent them and I did. And when the third condition which I s set, that if I called you as a witness, he took the stand and I asked him, now mind you the courtroom was full of reporters and so forth, and um, I asked him, uh, Mr. Giancana, um, what work or profession are you in? He said, I own and operate hotels. In how many states? He said, tell me. He gave the number of states, all right. Then finally I asked him, I said, uh, you have noticed, haven't you, some squad cars of the federal government following you everywhere you go? Yes. Uh, have you tried to find out why they're doing that? Yes. What did you do? Well, I went to them, asked them. And what did they say? They didn't say anything. They laughed at me. How many times did you try to find out? Oh, you know. I said, all right, now, um, from what you know, is it something you have done? I said, no, I haven't done anything. He said, <laughs> mind you, this is the world's greatest criminal. Huh? And then I asked him, um, have you violated any orders or laws of the uh, city of Oak Park? No. Have you violated any statutes of the law? No. Have you violated any ordinance of the city of Chicago? No. Have you violated any statutes of the United States? No. Have you committed any wrong against anybody? No. Have you? I, I then turned to John Lulinski, the state, the United States attorney. You may cross it. You know, I, 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 I remained awake that night, worried about that question. He said, no. You may cross examine. John O'Lindsay got up and said to your honor, Judge Austin, uh, we have no question of this witness. And I have a word because he opened himself up. Judge Layton practiced law for 18 years. I was elected to the Circuit Court of Cook County in November 1964 and took office in December 65. Um, uh, it, it all kind of f fell in, you know, and uh, I got good uh, support from the bar associations. Uh, Mayor Daly was the political kingpin, and uh, I was a friend of his. He was a friend of mine. I knew him very well. He called me. I didn't call him and asked me if I would take a job as a circuit court judge. That's like your superior court here in Massachusetts. I ran and was elected. Then I ran for re-election and was re-elected. Three years into my judgeship as a circuit court judge, which is a trial judge, the chief justice of the Supreme Court of Illinois called me from Springfield, whom I knew him from work I had done elsewhere. And he asked me if I would be willing to be an appellate court justice. And I accepted. So about three years after I was a circuit court judge, I became an appellate court justice. While I was the appellate court justice, the senior senator from Illinois to the United States Senate Charles Percy asked me to come and see him in his office, and I went. And he told me he was going to recommend me to Gerald Ford, who was then president of the United States, and a Republican. And all my life I've been a Democrat. And uh, he said he wanted to recommend me. Would I accept? I, t I told him, I will. And I became a federal judge. In 2004, he returned to the school he left in 1929, Roosevelt Middle School. The event was the dedication 
of the Judge George and Layton Courtyard. They say that you can't come a full circle in life necessarily, and some say life is a circle. I'm a believer that life is a circle. So I think it's only appropriate, and I consider it my personal honor to have your name on our courtyard making a full circle of your life back here to Roosevelt. In 2005, the New Bedford Post Office became the Honorable Judge George N. Layton Post Office Building. The post office is really the symbol of, of, of our community. You know, we get into the social media, but as I've said, uh, there's something about the post office that, that symbolizes uh, the coming together of America. The Postal Service was one of the first government entities established in America. Uh, George Washington appointed the first postmaster general. It brings the country together. You can, I can mail a letter in New Bedford and go anywhere in America uh, within a few days. And I think that's something we should preserve. That's a very important issue. The post office is a sign of, of the uniting of America. You don't have to spend a lot of money uh, to do it. Uh, the post office is a place in the community where people come. It's a, it's a, it's a regular stopping point. It's a place that, that people uh, have a lot of business at. So post offices have come to symbolize that. And I've said when I've dedicated this post office, uh, one or two others, uh, well, people think, oh, the mail is outdated and we now into the social media. And no one's ever asked me to name an iPhone after anybody. Uh, it's the post offices that are our, our symbols. Hoje, se no teu homenagear George Leiton, também no teu homenagear tudo que se pai, se mãe, que sei de Calveira de Chigatelli. If today we're paying homage to Judge Leiton, we also have to pay homage to his parents that left those islands to come here. No pensa que ele nasceu em 1912. Como é que era o mundo naquela altura, ou uns anos antes, hora que vocês alguém te saiba de brava para bem para Let's look at the fact that he was born in 1912. What life must have been for those that were leaving the little island of Brava to come here, to come here. Um catacansa cufla que que as gente que vem de Cabo Verde, na que as barco a vela, é é um grande herói, é é que te mostra o que é que Cabo Verdeano na hora que ele crê ele pode fazer. I never get tired of saying how the people that came from those islands on those small little boats, on small little uh, sailboats, that are true, true people that actually never tired of doing what they did for the good of the country. The immigrants are the people of energy, the people of drive. And uh, Judge Layton and, uh, and his family are an example of that. And I thought this is a case uh, of a man who's done extraordinary things on his own. Um, he got into law school, uh, overcoming a lack of a formal education. Uh, and, and he did it while remaining the most low-key, uh, pleasant guy. You know, it's a, it's a cliche to say, oh, he's a great man, but he's humble. Well, he genuinely is. In 2012, the Cook County Courthouse became the George N. Layton Criminal Court Building. I can just see him smiling because he would, he would talk about the fact that he's got buildings named after him in, in his two home cities. Jim, I've got buildings named after me in my two home cities, New Bedford and in Chicago, the city that birthed me and the city that welcomed me. I can't forget what New Bedford did for me. New Bedford did a lot for me. New Bedford made me what I was. To the extent that I was educated here, it formed the person known as George N. Clayton. Because after all, as I said, I am a return of the maker. Judge Layton will be 100 years old on October 22nd, 2012.